It's going to be hard to shake the feeling I felt that morning. Tuesday, August 11, 2014. My alarm was set to the radio and was set for 6 a.m. in the morning. When it went off, this is what I heard. ISIS continues its rampage across Iraq. Hamas is still slaughtering many in Israel, and that conflict is still going on in the Gaza Strip. Breaking news, actor Robin Williams has been found dead in his home in California. And in other news, riots are still continuing in Ferguson, Missouri, after an unarmed teenager was shot multiple times and killed by a police officer. The news that morning gave me no reason that I should wake up with a smile and rejoice in the current day. It was hard to see any hope. Rather, news that morning made me want to roll over and go back to sleep in the hope that I was waking up to a bad, from a bad dream. Yet I must face the reality that when I surveyed the events of the world, there's a lot of weakness. In fact, Sometimes there is so much for me to engage with and analyze that I don't know how to offer any hope to anyone in any of those situations. And as I read the pages of Scripture, I see that it is not a new predicament. Throughout the millennia, since the fall of humanity, history has been one of brokenness. Yet, God has always spoken hope. Turn with me to Isaiah 51, 1 through 3. And let's look together at one of God's promises to his people at a very, very bleak and miserable time. Maybe as we look into this text and tease out what was going on there, we might be able to know how to properly respond and react to the brokenness around us and all around the world. That's Isaiah 51, 1 through 3. Please turn there with me. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you are dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. Let me set the picture. Israel is in a bad place. After only three kings, the nation divides between the northern ten tribes and the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. These tribes, when they aren't at war with surrounding countries, they are at war with each other. Sometimes, in fact most of the times, it seemed like they are at war with each other and the other countries at the same time. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel is taken captive by Assyria. And then in 586, the southern kingdom of Judah falls to the Babylonians. This passage in Isaiah was written either in 700, AD, 700 BC, after the fall of the northern kingdom, or as most scholars date it due to the language and the shift in the text, to be around 540 BC, after the northern and the southern kingdom have fallen, and Jerusalem has been taken captive. Either way you look at it, God's people are in a black, bleak, and dreary place. And the author has been aware of this as Isaiah has been compiled. Starting in chapter 40, there is a move towards Israel being redeemed. 
and God's people being restored to him inside of this awful situation. As he discusses, as he discusses how God will save his people, he begins to point out that Israel's salvation is not for the people of Israel alone. Rather, their restoration and blessing will be a light to the other nations. And God's work will be done through the promised servant who appears throughout the book of Isaiah. And that's where we find our text. I'm going to read it once again to let it resonate with us. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. As one I called him, then blessed him and multiplied him. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And her wilderness, he will make like Eden. And her desert, like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and sound of melody. The author was proclaiming the simple message. Listen and look. Hey you, he says, the one who loves me, who walks in my ways, who pursues justice and peace. Pay close attention. Remember your heritage. Remember the roots. Know that I have always kept my promises. God was calling the men and women that kept his covenant and who sought his ways to stand strong and be encouraged. Despite all that surrounded them, the desolate lands, the city ruins, and the foreign oppressors, they were to look at God's work of redemption. The image used of rocks and pits is mentioned first because it informs them about why they should look to Abraham and Sarah for encouragement. The Lord was declaring that he is the same God of covenant integrity who called Abraham, who protected Israel during the Exodus, and is currently watching over them. We see this throughout Scripture where it is God as one, or God alone, called as we hear in the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And in this passage, I called him as one. The Lord is still the same God who called that unknown people, that unknown couple from Ur of the Chaldeans, brought them to the promised land, and gave them offspring, blessing, protection, and land. He is still the same God who took the one man and the one woman, and made them as numerous as the sands of the seashore. God was saying he is still the same God who took a barren woman and made her fertile well after the age of childbirth. He is still the same God who keeps his promises, he's declaring to them, looks after his own, and can bring life from a dead Situation. That is what the Lord was telling those who pursue righteousness and seek after Him. He is still the same God who makes a, a people for Himself and through them blesses the world. He is still the same. This was a much needed proclamation for the original audience of the message. As a whole, they had lost their way many times and had endured so much darkness and so much pain. One could summarize Israel's history in being one continuous cycle of losing its way, a few righteous people realizing this, and calling out to God in repentance, and then God brings salvation and restoration. And then the cycle resumes shortly thereafter. And to the people who were following the Lord during that time, this was a most agonizing period. 
For they knew that God's people were to shine forth His glory into each and every corner of the world, and to be the people of righteousness, peace, and mercy. But all too often, it was the other way around. God's people were corrupt, idolatrous, and worked hard to look and become exactly like the other nations they were supposed to be an example to. Yet the Lord remained the same God, and was saying to them, at that current time in history, listen and look. I am still a redeeming God who can make things new. This is still His word today. He still says to those seeking righteousness and seeking His face to look to His covenant faithfulness through the ages. Look at the historically verified fact that He is good. And that His faithfulness is without end. The God who called Abraham, blessed Abraham, and brought life to Sarah's womb is still the same God who calls out to His people in every corner of the earth. His ways never change. He is the Holy Creator, Comforter, and Provider. But let's look at His promise that, gives, that He gives after this charge before we start jumping too far into trying to respond to this text. Because we really need to read verse 3 to get the full picture of this passage and the comfort that He's trying to give. Verse 3. For the Lord will comfort Zion he will comfort all her waste places, and her wilderness he will make like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and sound of melody. All right, when the people of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdom, heard the name Zion, they would have thought of the mountain of the Lord and the city of David. Yes, they would have thought of the city of Jerusalem, where God was said to be resting between the wings of the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant inside of that temple. So this verse brings forth an image of God stepping down and making a dwelling place with His people, a restoration to Eden. And if this passage was written in 540 B.C., This picture would have also been a very hard picture to wrestle with. They had been dealing with the destruction of their city of Jerusalem. And were looking forward to a temple where they could meet and worship God. And one thing to also note is that every country had a deity that was viewed as being some source of all fertility. Whether agricultural animals, or human fertility, the ability to bear offspring. And stating that Zion was to be made fertile, and that it will look like the lush garden of Eden, the Lord is stating that He is the source of all life to Israel. More than that, just like Eden, Zion will once again become a place of walking and worshiping God. Walking with Him in an atmosphere of praise. His presence will be tangible, visible, and celebrated among His people once again. He is stating that He's not just promising a place to meet and offer a sacrifice. He was promising to bring His own glory to His people. His promise is a dwelling together of joy and multiplication that shows forth just how true He is to His character. Indeed, His promise of comfort arises from His very own character. But did this ever come true? Did God ever comfort His people? Did they ever receive this blessing of abundance and fertility like the Garden of Eden? Has the temple that they built ever been so gloriously radiating the presence of the Lord that people came and rejoiced and celebrated? Did the land ever become, once again, like Eden? 
The short answer to that question is no. But the long answer is that for hundreds of years after this promise, the people looked to each political revolt, to each prophet, or any event of significance to bring about God's promises. And this picture came fairly close when the second temple was rebuilt. And when Jerusalem walls had once again start to be finished. Yet those who had seen the first temple cried and mourned when they saw the size comparison. They knew that it wasn't the fulfillment of the promise that God gave. And there were people who thought that this promise of a temple and a dwelling place and a presence of God was close whenever Herod built the temple on the Temple Mount. One which was then shortly destroyed after it was constructed. Because the people of Israel were yet again in another war with another nation. And all the while the people of Israel failed to see the promises come true of Abraham. Moses and the world. They didn't see the fulfillment to any of them. They missed the suffering servant. They missed how God was fulfilling the promises. They missed the one who came and said, before Abraham was, the one that you look to, I am. They missed the servant who said, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus is the one who brings about the promises of God. Jesus is the one who redeems the lost, wandering, and confused. He is the seed of Abraham by which God brings blessings to the world. He is righteousness, and He is the Lord. But what does all this mean? Am I just making a stereotypical Christian reading of an Old Testament passage and leaving everyone with a Snoopy bandage? for their wounds and for their pain? Am I giving a simple answer to those people who see the chaos in this world and, world and it shatters what they thought was the reality of God's promises? How is Jesus the answer to the problems of the world? How is he the fulfillment of God's promises and just how exactly is he bringing Eden to earth? Let me explain. But just a heads up, it is a simple answer, but it's not an easy answer. When God promised Abraham that he would bless those who blessed him, and that through him all the nations would be blessed, yes, he was looking forward to Jesus, but God was not thinking of Jesus Christ alone. God was also stating that Abraham's descendants would be vessels God would use to bless other nations. God's people were meant to be a light among the nations that radiated God's glory and presence. This was his continual call throughout Deuteronomy and the entire prophetic words. They were to treat other nations as neighbors and were, and were to rely solely upon God, teaching other nations to do the same. In this way, Israel would be the first fulfillment as a people group of this promised Messiah named the Suffering Servant in this book. It was to be through them that God saw God, that people saw God. But they failed miserably. In fact, they looked to every other God and forsook the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. They were to point others to the Lord, but instead... They looked to the gods of other countries and worshipped them. They did not see God's promises or his character holding true. So, at the time of most desperation, Jesus came and he called everyone to him. See, he was Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
He healed the sick, mute and lame. He multiplied food, cast out demons, and raised the dead. He brought the presence of God to earth. He bore people's sins, infirmities, and sorrows. He restored humanity to God and offered salvation to everyone. He tore the veil of the temple and said, You can enter now boldly into God's presence, for I am Him, and I give you abundant life. And after having done all this, when he ascended into heaven, he said, You will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In essence, he is saying, he is saying Take my presence, my name, my story, and my restoration wherever you go. Take it to the barren wastelands and desert places where people who do not know my name and show them that the kingdom of God is here. Give them my hope and teach them to sing my praises. Give them the joy of the Lord who bears their pain, who bears their sorrow and bears their emptiness. Be my presence among them and bear their pain as I bore yours. Through Jesus, all people have a chance to become part of the family of God, just like what was promised to Abraham. The one to whom you are called to look in this very past. As part of the family of God, we are promised to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are promised and declared to be where God dwells as the Holy Spirit. And then we, as the family of God, the church, we are to be the means by which God brings about peace, blessing, and joy into the world. This is not a superficial financial comfort and wellness that we're promised, nor is it a pat on the back to those who don't drink, smoke, curse, or chew, or go with girls who do. Nor is it a simple statement that someday God will destroy this earth and heaven, and a new one will be created. So let's spell this out in a more precise manner. How we, as God's people, can answer this text. How we, as those who pursue righteousness and seek the Lord, can look to Abraham and see the promise of comfort. First, we have to stop placing our hope in any other person than Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in a politician or a political party. We do not look to legislation to bring about peace to the disenfranchised in the world. Rather, we give them the hope of Christ in tangible means, and we bring the peace of Christ to, the, to people through relationship. In doing this, we might also stand behind a legislation or people, but our hope we offer is not a law or a legislation or a politician or even a protest. Our hope we give others is that Jesus Christ suffered for them, their sin, and their situation, and offers an eternal life of abundant joy with him in heaven, they repent and follow him. And by giving Jesus Christ to people through tangible means, and by sharing the story of him with them inside of a relationship, we are fulfilling the call of God to listen and look. We must never lose sight that we are giving people historically rooted hope. God is true to his promises. He was true to Abraham, and he was true to all his other promises he gave. We see this in Jesus, the one who we are giving to others. And we show that he is true to Abraham, because Jesus Christ 
the seed of Abraham changed our lives and will radically change our lives and has reconciled us with a holy and awesome God. As we give Christ to others, we show God's promises are true. For God promised to bless the world through Abraham, and he did that through Christ and now through us. God is true to his promises. A second way that we can apply this passage to our lives. So we have to stop putting our own comfort and ease ahead of the gospel. The gospel says to bring the kingdom of God, which I have argued is what God is promising in verse 3, to the sick, to the naked, disenfranchised, and imprisoned. Christ came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Too many times we separate from all those who have issues in the world, and we isolate into segregated groups of people who want to look holy. Too often we create a group of self-righteous, rule-making people who dare not touch anyone or anything outside of a church wall. We take the blessedness of God's presence and we hoard it. We stick it in our pockets. We take the goodness of God, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the saints, and then we quench the spirit that tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And to those outside of our closed group, we just look like fun-hating hypocrites. They see no peace, joy, or comfort to desire. They see no blessing of an Eden or the garden of the Lord or a place of thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So let's bring the kingdom of God outside of our closed doors and allow ourselves to be in risk of discomfort, pain, or even persecution and bring the comfort of Zion to those who pursue righteousness and seek the Lord. And let's bring this to the people who might not even know who the name of the Lord is. Third, be in prayer for those inside of your sphere of influence and outside of your sphere of influence who are living lives of pain and suffering. Be in prayer for them because they feel like God has forsaken them. It is all too easy to turn homelessness or race riots or genocide and various other pain and sufferings into political issues where we throw an opinion on Facebook or on a blog post or we tweet about it. Yet we never come before the throne room of God and beg for his intercession. Spend time each day praying that God will bring healing and restoration and pray that God will soften our hearts to the plight of others. Pray that he leads us into ways of bringing heaven to that person or people group that is suffering. Finally, and this is mostly as a side note, too much time is spent amongst, among Christians arguing and debating about various terms and issues rather than working to spend time bringing God's goodness, the comfort of Zion, to others. In fact, many times people are accused of not caring about the gospel or watering down truths just because they care about social issues or offer a drink of water, or a sandwich, instead of just handing people Bible tracts, or arguing about a various theological point for the person. We have even made up derogatory terms and names for these Christians that try to bring about the verse 3 into the life of other people. Our infighting is confusing to unbelievers. 
and we hurt the cause of the gospel in the name of the Lord, when we refuse to help physical people in a physical world with physical problems, we are being agents of we are to be recon we are to be agents of reconciliation and good news on this earth. And if we cannot be that amongst ourselves as believers, then we have completely lost sight of the one who saved us and gives us hope. Friends, we are to look throughout history and see that God is true to His promises. And let us not forget that when God gave these promises, He said to be His presence and to share His presence among the world. Thank you. May God make His face to continually shine upon you. And may He help us find ways to follow His Word and to be those who provide comfort inside of waste places and who bring the promises of God. Amen.